Hello there and welcome once again to the Mayor's Magazine. I'm Mick Cornett, the Mayor of Oklahoma City, and this is our program for June 2015. In our first segment, we're going to learn more about the Museum of Art that's in downtown Oklahoma City and a lot of the exciting programs they have coming to us this summer. And Tracy Trulls is here. Tracy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Your title says you're the Curator of Education at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. That means I get to do the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in talking to Tracy before we, we, we started uh, recording the show, uh, Tracy told me she grew up in Oklahoma City, uh, went off to college, uh, worked in some other very exciting places, but has come home. So let's talk about that. Give us a little bit of, uh, of, of your bio and, and, and where you grew up. Yeah, so grew up in North Oklahoma City, uh, went to school in Edmond and uh, went off to college, had some great experiences. Uh, taught school in Chicago, um, mm -hmm. Chicago Public Schools, and uh, really loved the arts experiences that my students had there. We worked with arts organizations, museums, we went on field trips, and I thought, you know, I would really love to impact students and, and families and just people in general from the, from the kind of the art side. So uh, kind of melded my love of education, went back to school, studied arts administration, and then just had some great experiences uh, learning about museums and art centers, spent some time down at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and then uh, my husband and I uh, just decided it's time to come home. Mm -hmm. uh, we really wanted to uh, kind of practice what we did in our, in our hometown, so it's been a real honor and privilege to be back here doing doing the work that I was kind of trained to do mm -hmm. um, right here impacting my own community. We've so. had a lot of efforts in Oklahoma City about trying to expose the arts to young people. So let's mm -hmm. talk about some of those successes. Absolutely. Um, you know, studies show that if uh, families and parents take their kids to the museum, that, that becomes a lifelong habit. Um, and as, of course, as I know many of us know, um, the arts inspire creativity and they spark innovation as well. Um, they build confidence for kids and they help them just kind of express, um, express themselves, express, ex you know, what's going on in their daily lives. And I must say, working with adults and kids at the museum, I see that it has the same effect for adults as well, um, which is great. Um, and actually, with Fabergé, our next exhibition, we have a whole hands-on area um, where everybody's going to be invited to uh, design an imperial Fabergé Easter egg inspired by what they've seen. And um, I'm excited to see what the kids come up with, but also the adults that sit down and give it a shot. Yeah, because when you talk about education and the arts, I guess you, your first instinct might be that a big busload of kids is going to come up and they're going to walk yeah. through and look at things. Yeah, and we... Yeah, I think that's the way it was when I was a yeah. kid. Yeah. And we absolutely do that. That's our tour program is a, is a core part of um, kind of our educational mission. I think last year we had 7,000 school children come through the museum um, and, you know, have deep experiences with works of art. Um, but it's, it's also nice to kind of get them, you know, coming in with their families and other loved ones as well. Um, so they're kind of getting it both at school but also through kind of an enriched uh, creative home life. And it's fun because families get to come to the museum and get messy. And sometimes, you know, in our day-to-day day -day routines, it's a little bit hard when you're making dinner and getting homework done. It's hard to say, okay, well, let's stop and do a printmaking project. Um, so that's that's one thing that we, we love to do. We love to inspire. So you can come see some amazing works of art that artists have created, but then also inspire the artist and yourself. And, and, uh, and you know, we have everything kind of set up for you. And oftentimes a, a community um, teaching artists there, facilitating that experience. So you're kind of getting to interact with artists as well, and um, it just we love what we do. This show is going to run throughout the month of June. Let's talk about the Fabergé exhibit mm -hmm. that's coming in. When does it start? So Fabergé officially opens on Saturday, June 20th, 2015, um, and we will have a preview event on Friday, June 19th. And we're so excited about this exhibition. It's it's really a once in a lifetime. Well, for, for someone that's never heard of a Fabergé egg, tell people what 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 this actually is. How this begin? <laughs> yeah. So um, the tradition of um, Easter egg, you know, the, the tradition of giving eggs is something that goes way back. Um, Fabergé particularly is working um, in Russia. So this is the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, and you know, painting wooden eggs and giving them was something that people did for a long time. Um, and actually the, the, the ruling family of Russia um, started to commission Fabergé, who was just a master jeweler. We think about, you know, craftsmanship, handiwork, and that's the kind of thing that's very, people are very interested in that right now. Um, you know, Fabergé and his workshop, um, I mean, they were just masters at what they did. So, um, so the, uh, the czar came to Fabergé and said, you know, I'd like to give uh, my mother an egg. And um, they, 
came up, they designed this incredibly um, intricate jeweled um, Easter egg that he then gave to her. Um, and the, the tradition continued, uh, was part of the kind of Russian imperial family um, yearly tradition. And it actually culminated with the Romanovs, which I, I think are a, fam a Russian fam imperial family many are familiar with. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting the the eggs are all unique. Um, they're all um, incredibly detailed, created by um, master jewelers. Uh, they all look very different from one another. And the neat thing about the eggs is that they all have something inside them called a surprise. And mm -hmm. so all of the eggs open and there's, there's some sort of element inside. So when people come to the museum, we're, we're going to have four imperial eggs, which is, which is great. Um, and the surprise will actually be on display as well. Um, this is actually the largest collection of Fabergé um, outside of Russia. It comes to us from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond. So um, the eggs are fascinating and they've fascinated people for a long time and I know they'll fascinate people here because on one level, you know, it's this gift from the czar to the czarina, the, you know, but on this very personal level, it's a gift between a man and his wife or a man, you know, a, a son and a mother, and, which is something we can all relate to. So there's really just layers of history and then also just the beautiful objects themselves to really take in as part of the experience. Okay. And so there's a preview on the 19th, and then it starts on the 20th. What does admission cost to, to, to come to the... So it's $12 yeah. for adults, mm -hmm. and um, that gets you into the special exhibition Fabergé. We also have an Andy Warhol exhibition going on through July 12th. So if you come for the first month, you'll, you'll be able to catch that as well. And then, of course, our permanent collection. Mm -hmm. And as I was mentioning earlier, what's great with Fabergé is that we have the, the exhibition, which includes the four imperial legs, all manner of, of other objects created by Fabergé. Um, but then we have a design studio as well, and that's a place where um, everyone, but especially people with, with kids and younger ones can come. And we have an art project in there um, with some great jewelers templates and some beautiful colored pencils where they can design an egg. And they have a chance to leave it um, on the wall for others to see, or they can take it home. So that's, we're really excited to, to see all the eggs that people design and leave. Um, so yeah, just, you know, reading materials, lots of great hands-on stuff to do in there. So if people in Oklahoma City have family and friends coming from other parts of the country, this would be a great time to yeah. get them out to the Museum of Art. And uh, you can bring the kids. But uh, as she mentioned, the Andy Warhol exhibit is in town. The Fabergé eggs are, are in town. And of course, the the ongoing exhibits that are at the museum, including the Shahuli glass Dale that, is, that yeah. everyone knows about. <laughs> we all love and love to revisit. Tracy, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. And we'll have more on the Mayor's Magazine right after this. Did you know that the arts make a significant impact on education, the economy, and our quality of life in Oklahoma? Providing more than 10,000 jobs statewide? Filtering more than $314 million into our economy? Yes. The arts create all kinds of beautiful things. And making Oklahoma an even better place to live is the most beautiful thing of all. It doesn't take a big donation to make big things happen. Support Allied Arts today. A little give is all it takes. Welcome back to the Mayor's Magazine. I'm Mick Cornett, the mayor of Oklahoma City. And in this segment, we're going to visit with Tara Henson, who's the Director of Marketing and Public Relations at the Oklahoma City Zoo. Welcome back to the show. Well, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. This may be the most exciting time that I can remember in the zoo. We have uh, new baby elephants. Yes. We have uh, baby rhino. Yes. Probably have some other babies, too, that I, I can't think of off the top yes. of my head. But we have, <laughs> we have a new zoo hospital. Uh, and then the summer programs are getting ready to launch. So I don't know where we start with all that. In fact, I think we're now, I know we're going to go to two segments to, to get all this in. Uh, but let's start with, uh, with the elephants. And, uh, okay. you know, people know we've had baby elephants, uh, you know, a couple of times here in the last four or five years. Yep. But um, we've got some new elephants in that came in from the zoo in Seattle as well. Yes, we welcome Bamboo and Chai from the Willem Park Zoo in Seattle. And um, they are more like ants or maybe even grandmas. <laughs> and so that's going to make for a wonderful social situation so that we have a multi-generational herd, which is great for elephants. And that was the primary reason why these ants that these elephants came here. So, you know, we have baby Akara that was born in December, and then Mei Lee, who's about four years old, and then we have Asha and Chandra, two uh, females, uh, aunt and mom. And then adding these two girls will just be great. It's just mm -hmm. going to be fantastic. And then, of course, we have Rex, the bull elephant. Now, Rex likes to spend time on his own, so if people wonder why he's usually by himself, 
that's what they do. They only come together when they want to have a date, and then they go on their merry way. So you'll see the girls together, and then Rex off by himself unless he's a. Uh, We've been wanting to, to populate uh, the Absolutely. elephant exhibit, and so this is a this is a big addition. Three in the last few months. It, it's very important, and it just goes to the um, conservation commitment of the zoo, and also the passion that we have for not only conservation but the history of elephants at the zoo. And you know, we have this fantastic new elephant habitat that we're very grateful to the taxpayers and so many people that have helped make that uh, come about and in the next few years we'll extend that habitat into an Asian themed exhibit that's going to be fantastic and showcase Asian themed animals so that's great and it's not just a baby elephant tell me about some of the other the new baby animals well besides the baby elephants which is hard not to talk about but we also have like you mentioned Rupert the rhino and he's got his own fan club and following and in fact he's been loving all the rain that we had back in May <laughs> uh, mud wallows and and flopping around in the mud that makes him very happy he does love to play out in the rain and then of course we have some uh, western lowland gorillas we had Ruby spelled with an I and she was born not too long ago and she sticks by mom's side for the first couple of years of her life so you can see her around and nothing but cute when you look at that mm -hmm. that baby gorilla and of course Liam is is not a lot older he's another young gorilla and then if you want to see some really uh, interactive playful animals too the chimps we still have Reuben and Siri and Zoe and they're all in different ages of uh, being toddlers and if you think toddler children are interesting, you ought to uh, come out and see toddler chimps because <laughs> there's always something going on with their interactions and their um, social skills and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, tell me about the new uh, the zoo summer program. Well, summer programs are very popular. Education programs at the zoo are popular year-round. We always recommend that you check out the website, that you, um, if you're a zoo friend, be sure and check out your zoo sounds. They book quickly. We have summer camps uh, right now through August and children ages 3 to 15 have opportunities. You know the zoo itself makes for a wonderful summer camp opportunity but you also get these wonderful interactions close up and personal with zoo ambassadors um, which are some of our animals that I know we're going to show a little bit later here in your segment or in the show rather and um, it's fantastic. Um, it's an all-day camp that's something new this year. Mm. Uh, there's a discount if you're a member. You can check out the prices on the website. And every week is a different theme. So it's always something new and innovative, uh, really engaging kids and getting outside and, and connecting more with nature. You know, it seems like, and I know you're a big proponent for being active, but sometimes kids are inside too much or yeah. they're on their computers and technology is wonderful, but let's get outside and, and really look at insects and enjoy the fresh air and, and walk. And we have great walking trails and the kids are out and active at all times. The educators do a fantastic fantastic job of keeping them engaged and also teaching them a little something they don't realize that they're having so much fun. <laughs> so what do they do? What would a kid do in a, in a what could be considered an average day at, at zoo camp? Oh, at camp? Well, they'll uh, come in and they might have, um, they'll learn about what they're going to do for the day and they'll have some up close and personal interactions with some of the education ambassador animals. They might go out and um, do a specific tour, meet a zookeeper on any given day. There's probably going to be some downtime too, but they can make some crafts and depending on their age uh, might have story time for the younger kids. Uh, sometimes they actually go fishing. You know, our, our lake is um, a lake that you can fish from and so they learn uh, great um, ways to fish and, and to be in the environment and leave it better than they found it. So all kinds of neat stuff. Nature hikes. It just is uh, wide and varied and we have special guests that come in sometimes too and I know our educators are always mm -hmm. throwing a little something different into the mix. And we have a new zoo hospital that's r relatively new. Well, you know, it's opening actually in July, mid to late July, and we couldn't be more excited about it. It's a great uh, private-public partnership. 4.5 million of it came from sales tax support. 4.5 million came from uh, donors. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the primary gift, of course, came from the Kirkpatrick Philanthropies. And it's going to be fantastic. It's only one, there's only one, uh, let's see, we will be one of five in the nation that you can actually come and enjoy um, a hospital as part of your zoo visit. Wow. You'll be, oh, you'll be able to see the vets at work, lab work, um, surgeries, uh, radiology, great teaching opportunities uh, for people when they come and see, um, excellent interactive um, activities for kids. I mean, you're not gonna see a procedure at all times because there won't be a procedure at all times. So one day or one hour you might see a bird that's beak needs to be trimmed or you might get to see one of our uh, 
chefs, if you will, creating diets or, or meals for our animals. And it's so beautiful. The visitor center has lots of interactives. There's videos where you can see procedures taking place and healthcare that you would have, you've never dreamed of that mm -hmm. actually occurs. And it's going to be a state of the art, just beautiful facility. And it's named after Joan Kirkpatrick, who's been um, just uh, uh, her family has just loved the zoo for years and years. So the John Kirkpatrick Animal Hospital, we couldn't be more excited about it. Okay, and I know we got one more segment, but let's let's remind people the zoo hours for the summer. We're open nine to five daily, and you know we're only closed in Thanksgiving, New Year's, mm -hmm. Christmas. So plenty of time to come out and enjoy. And attendance in 2015 was going fabulous until May got here because it rains so much. <laughs> Well, uh, don't people, they say April people, showers people bring May flowers? <laughs> well, in this case, uh, let's see, May showers bring, a, a, well, they bring flowers, and the zoo is beautiful. Our, our gardening team does a fantastic job. Um, attendance is holding its own. I mean, it's been great, and we're going to do well, and people are still coming out, and uh, it, it's just gorgeous right now. It's so green and lush and beautiful. Do the animals seem to mind when it rains? I think it depends on the animal. I mean, you know, the sea otter, or sea otters, the river otters, the bears, uh, some of those animals are like, yippee, I'm in the water, I'm having a great time, sea lions, the elephants love it, they're out in the water. Um, the only thing that we really uh, pay closer attention to is if there's an abundance of water, you know, a flash flood, of course, sure. or lightning. You know, you want to make sure everybody's safe there. You can come out and feed giraffes and touch a stingray. The stingrays love the rain at Stingray Bay or go over to a sea lion show. There's just always something new and exciting to do at the zoo. Let's take a break and come back okay. and we'll have an animal on the Mayor's Magazine. It's next. It's down here. That dog has a thirsty look in his eye. Did you know that it's really not that hard to save water? Like here in the sink. Don't make me run too much. Could um, somebody shut me off? <laughs> now this is my kind of party. A full house. Let's roll. Hey, we're in a drought, which means I'm kind of a big deal. So save me. Really? Save me! Welcome back to the Mayor's Magazine. Teresa Randall has joined Tara and I on the Thank set, you. and she has brought a friend. Let's start with, I guess that's a lizard? Yes, this is Mick. He is a blue tongue skink. <laughs> yes. uh. Yeah, we're very creative in our naming at the zoo. He's one of our education ambassadors that the kids will meet at one of the many summer camps that we have going, uh, which will start here in just another week or two. So uh, he's just a wonderful ambassador for mm -hmm. reptiles in general because a lot of kids are sort of scared of reptiles. Well, so. with good reason. They're scary. <laughs> oh, uh, well, he's how, not is scary. He, is he full size or is he? Yes, um, he is an Indonesian species of lizard and this is about as large as they get. Huh? Uh, he does, as, as most lizards, he eats insects and um, occasionally he'll eat a, a beetle or maybe even a small worm. But is uh, he fast? Does he does he have to have uh, he dexterity actually, and athletic ability to eat? There's his tongue. Uh, to eat, not so much. But mm -hmm. if I put him on the ground, we would all need to put on some sneakers to catch him for sure. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. He could run. And so his tongue is a bright blue color. Oh and that's wow! To sort of, I saw it there. That's to uh, warn other predators and kind of make himself look a little scarier. Uh huh. Well. Mission accomplished. <laughs> uh, let's talk about this uh, this lovely animal here that's disguised as a rock. Well, this that's is Poppy. Yeah, she's not a bocce ball. She actually <laughs> is an animal. And tell us about Poppy. She is a southern three-banded armadillo. And she's and, in there somewhere. And <laughs> she's a South American species, so we brought some international visitors, Asian and South American. Uh -huh. um, she mostly is active at night, so she might still be a little sleepy this mm -hmm. morning. But um, she is a full-size armadillo. Uh, the ones that we have in Oklahoma are quite a bit larger. Mm -hmm. uh, she is a mammal, but you'll notice that she's showing her, her best defense mechanism, which is to close all the way up. Uh -huh. And uh, that's to protect her because her main predator is jaguar. Mm -hmm. So she wants she's to not going to outrun the jaguar. Um, no, so, sir. so her only hope no, is hope, to hope is to curl up, curl and, up and, and stay hope for tight. The best. Exactly, and so you can see her head there. How it's, it's a head. 
Yeah, and the nose is pointed downward, and then her tail curls upward to completely close. Wow, that's fascinating. What a d defense mechanism that is. And, and there are it? days when I wish I had that <laughs> exact same <laughs> defense mechanism. I could just curl up, and no one could get me. Well, with all this rain, I've been wanting to do that every morning when I'm woken. <laughs> no, right. But yeah. the kids are going to get a chance to meet. Yes. So these animals are specifically ambassadors through our education department. They go on Zoomobiles, on outreach. They're also there at the zoo and the kids will have an opportunity to meet many of these animals. We feel that it's critically important for kids to make a connection by physically touching and seeing and uh, sometimes you can smell the animals as well um, depending what they've done in their crate uh, but we want the kids to have that opportunity mm -hmm. to really get to know those those animals because so many that they'll see out on zoo grounds like the giraffe, the rhinos, they can't actually touch. Right. But these animals, and we have 42 of them that we use um, for kids to have those encounters with. Okay, so uh, this is all part of the summer program and, it, and oh, yes. kids are encouraged to get on the website, find out more about the programs. And, yes. and uh, so if you, if you think that if you go to a zoo, you're just going to see the animals from a cage or from a distance, not so. Not the case. That's, That's not, not the case. The case at we, our we, zoo. we want our kids to learn more about animals and we're going to teach them. And exactly. their habitats and, 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 and conserving them. And then, new this year, because we have the Joan Kirkpatrick Animal Hospital, we have a lot of veterinary camps going this summer, which have been wildly popular. Really? So, to teach mm -hmm. the kids yeah. about the state of the art care that the animals get, and then maybe they might want to be a vet when they go to school. All right, so uh, not just uh, the new elephants and the baby gorillas and all those other things, but a lot of opportunities for kids to get some hands-on experiences this summer at the wonderful Oklahoma City Zoo. Thank you both for coming on. Thank well, you, you're Mayor. you're welcome, and she'll probably come out as soon as we're off She's air. a little camera shy. <laughs> she is, and I don't know if she thinks you're a jaguar. I know. Oh, 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 there she was. She was thinking about it. She was thinking about it. Hey, yeah. check us out on social media, too, sir. Okay, if she saw me run, she would know I'm not a jaguar. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back with more of the Mayor's Magazine. Maureen Hefferman is going to be in to talk more about the Myriad Gardens. That's coming up next on the Mayor's Magazine. Here's to the things that can keep us safe. Those we use all the time with hardly a thought. Those that are silently standing by to save our lives. And now, those that we carry with us everywhere we go. Many mobile devices will now bring you wireless emergency alerts, real-time information directly from local sources you know and trust. With the unique sound and vibration, you'll be in the know wherever you are. Welcome back to the Mayor's Magazine. I'm Mick Cornett and Maureen Hefferman, the Executive Director of the Myriad Botanical Gardens is here. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You've got so much going on this time of year. This must be the busiest time for you. Uh, you know, people, I think every time is the busiest <laughs> time, but, but yes, absolutely. In the spring, I mean, weeds are growing, plants are growing, programs are, are getting started. Um, it, it's a great time. And all this rain we've be, been having yeah, in May Yeah, let's talk here, about rain because it's, it's very topical. We're taping this show in May and it's going to run throughout June. But how does uh, yeah. large amounts of rain or, or almost uh, weekly amounts of rain, how does that affect what you do? Well, it's, it's been fantastic. I mean, since I moved to Oklahoma City three and a half years ago, those were drought years yeah. and I'm really seeing a whole new state here and in and, and the gardens I mean these these plants have never had this kind of moisture moisture since they've been planted so they have just been lush and thriving and we've been doing quite a lot of new planting this spring we've put in a fairly extensive new prairie garden um, which is by our dog park it's between our dog park and Reno um, at that end of the property um, the south part of the gardens and it's, it's quite extensive, mm -hmm. and we've been fortunate that this weather has been fairly cool, lots of rain, so it's getting well established. So this rain could not be better, and it, it will have a wonderful impact for the whole season, getting mm -hmm. this much rain this early. It, it's been wonderful. June is a, is a month when a lot of people welcome visitors from out of town, and they probably will make this on their list of things to show off the myriad botanical gardens. What are some of the programming that uh, opportunities that you have that you know though people will want to make sure they they bring their visitors to see? Well, the the one that's coming up which I think will be will delight everyone, all ages, um, 
uh, really anybody who loves um, Charlotte's Web, the, the wonderful classic book by E.B. White. We're bringing that book to life. It opens June 5th. It goes through the 14th. We did this last year with The Secret Garden uh, to great success, and the staff selected this book um, to bring to life in our children's garden. And we do it for a number of reasons. Um, one is to increase membership. We have a small fee during that time period. Members are free, so we get a lot of new members that help supports, uh, support us in all that we do. Um, but it's to get children interested in plants and gardening and reading mm -hmm. books. And uh, it will be fantastic this year. We've got artists involved. Um, we have a topiary pig, which is worth having a festival around <laughs> just by itself. Our staff made it out of the polka dot plant, so it's the polka dot pig. And it's just charming. And we're bringing the book to life in little vignettes throughout the garden. We've got wonderful entertainment, crafts and things people can do. There'll be um, some vendors there, a farmer's market. And it's really wonderful. It's great for the whole family. I think bringing visitors to it, people will be very um, impressed with the quality and creativity that really we really try to do in, in everything that we um, execute there. So that's opening June 5th. Um, you're invited. Oh, thank uh, you. We're having a little preview party on June 5th. Um, and that runs, as I said, through the 14th. Um, another event in June, which is new for us, we're uh, trying a 5K run. A lot of groups do that. But we, we noticed that on Father's Day, uh, that seemed to be a, a nice niche for us to try. So on, on Father's Day this year, we're uh, having a 5K run to, which should be fun for people to come out to. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about uh, nighttime events. Uh, last last year and in years past, we've had we've had movies and concerts. Mm -hmm. Are those going to be back in 2015? Yep. We just had our first um, signature concert this past Saturday, which was terrific. Um, the Lone Bellows were our headliner from Brooklyn, New York. Um, we're bringing John Fulbright back. He was so popular last year. He's such a gifted performer from Oklahoma. He's coming back in the summer. Um, a new evening program that we're doing I think is going to be a lot of fun. I hope it's popular. Um, I got the idea for it. I was in Los Angeles last year, and they have a fairly new urban park in their downtown area, which they're having a lot of the um, revitalization that we're experiencing here. And they built a new park uh, called Grand Park. And I just happened to be there one evening, and they had a program called Dancing in the Gardens. And they have uh, live music. Uh, certain genres of music like salsa and they have dance instructors so before the music starts they have a instruction period and you don't have to know anything or you can be experienced and you, you learn some of these steps and then uh, the music plays in that genre and everybody just dances so it's it's very um, hip yet old-fashioned mm -hmm. and uh, we have that starting in July so it'll be once a month, July, August, September. Check our website for the dates. It'll be in the evening. Uh, we'll have lights up. And uh, even on a hot day, once the sun goes down, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty nice. So they'll be starting about 8.30 p.m. or so. So it, it should be quite nice. And uh, we hope it's, it's popular with a very diverse mm -hmm. audience. Is it difficult to determine how what attendance is at a, is at a park like this with so many entryways and obviously the admission is free to the park? How do you determine and, and do you know how many people visit? We estimate that, I mean, we have hundreds of thousands throughout the year. It's, it's really hard to estimate, but um, a lot of the programs where we have a registration mm -hmm. uh, and we can actually count people. Last year, in 2014, we had 64,000 people sign up for a program or come wow. to some event. And that doesn't include the casual visitor. It doesn't mm -hmm. include programs that other groups do, like the Arts Council does their Sunday um, Twilight Series or Arts Festival. Um, so we, we just, we, we estimate, we start to have a good sense of how many people can fit in d different spaces. And so we just estimate those numbers. Uh -huh. but, but lots of people, it's, it's um, certainly, it's growing, mm -hmm. the, the fact that people uh, expect the gardens now to have something going on and and more and more people are coming out for it so the movies of course will be back they're very popular um, our full moon bike rides on the night of the full moon that has been um, uh, really fun it's very simple but a lot of people get a kick out of it and then we take over the downtown trails at night it's a lot of fun <laughs> well it sounds great and uh, the best way to get information about what's taking place at the myriad botanical gardens go, go to our website but uh, also follow our Facebook and Twitter uh, you'll have a lot of fun I, I um, 
our Facebook posts and Twitter is always so much fun. It's, it's so varied and so different, and people can keep up with what we're doing that way. Maureen Hefferman is the executive director of the Myriad Botanical Gardens, and I hope people will uh, uh, you know, take note. In, in this show, we've introduced a lot of reminders that when you have visitors this uh, summer to your home, be sure and show them around Oklahoma City, to the zoo, to the Museum of Art, and of course, the Myriad Botanical Gardens. Maureen, thank you. Thank you. We'll have more on another edition of the Mayor's Magazine next month. We'll see you then. <laughs>